inciting violence is a very specific crime in British law and causing offence is not the same as inciting violence. No, I'm giving you an education. I'm asking, was she mobbed? So what? Do you see? Do you see? Exactly. So all the progressives, are you listening? A small Christian woman was mobbed by Muslim men and his answer is, so what? I say that we introduce a law in the United Kingdom that will make the burqa and the niqab illegal. And if you're offended by that, so what? So the next topic, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm going to talk about is about a brief history of identity in Europe. I've done this topic in the corner before, but we messed up the recording, so I'm going to have to do it again. So, can you guys talk to him and take him away? So, guys, a brief history of identity. From the conversion of the Roman Empire, European identity was a religious identity. Christians organized their society, the loci of organization was religion. It organized academia, it organized art, it organized politics, it organized economics, it organized the institutions of our society. And it did this for over a thousand years until a time called the Reformation. At the Reformation, there was a civil war so devastating that it killed tens of millions of Christians as Christian fought Christian, Protestant against Catholic, and millions of Christians died. This traumatized Europe so much that it searched for a new way to organize society. This gave birth to an intellectual project called the Enlightenment in which we sought to reorganize society along the lines of reason and rationality and to organize the politique and the economique along the lines of the nation state. And this is where we get our sense of being a nation state from. And this continued from the late 1700s until the early 1900s. And then an event happened that we call World War I. And that was quickly followed by a second world war. And these two wars, which really should be understood as one war, so traumatized Europe that Europe began to search for another way to organize society. And it began to suppress and to get rid of the idea of national identities. And it sought to reorganize society, its culture and politics and economics along the ideas of the self. This idea that the ego is God, that I am my own God, unquestionable in my authority. And so if I say to you, I am a woman, you can't argue with me. And if you do, you're guilty of a social blasphemy. You're guilty of hate speech. We have moved from a religious identity 
to a national identity, to the identity of the self. No, this move to the self is described by sociologists as post-modernity. Because the meta-narrative has been replaced. The meta-narrative that governed cultures have been replaced with petite narratives in which each of us are encouraged to form our own culture and our own traditions quite apart from one another. This benefits the elites because it turns you all into malleable consumers for the market. If you have no traditions and no customs, you begin to identify yourself by the things that you own and the experiences that you have. This is the malaise, the sickness at the heart of Western culture. But in this post-modernity, where the state has given up the idea of a meta-narrative common to all, we Christians have the opportunity to rediscover and to reorganize our own communities based upon our religious identity alone. To organize our own communities in this plural society as a religious community, following our religious customs, our religious traditions, our religious morality, our religious doctrines. We rediscover an identity that we have not had in Europe since the medieval period. We can take back something that has been stolen from us. But that means that all of you who understand that the West is sick with a cancer called the religion of the self must make it your journey to rediscover Christian traditions and customs, the history of the church, the doctrines of the Christian faith, and to live your life by the virtue ethics of the Christian faith. And you stand on them, and you fight for them, and you speak for them, and you unite with brothers and sisters around Europe who are doing the same as you. When we do this, we will carve out for ourselves space in this society. We will rediscover the seriousness of our faith. And when we take our faith seriously, the world around us will begin to take it seriously again. Perfect. The Christian faith and a Christian identity are not doctrines alone. They're not simply what we believe, but it's also how we live the ethical system we follow, the pentameter, the rhythm of our lives, decided by our customs and our traditions that set the pace of our life, that mark out the calendar of our life. And it's also about rediscovering our history as Christians, our contribution to civilization the sufferings of the church in the Enlightenment, in the Islamic Caliphates, and telling our history to the world. But that starts with you, you brothers and sisters, owning it for yourself. This is the only cure to the cancer that is the religion of the self. It's your choice. The religion of the self and more of this nonsense that we're seeing in the papers today and the erosion of Western civilization or 
the continued Islamification of our society and the con continued consumerization of our culture or a rediscovery of an identity last seen in a place called Christendom in Europe in medieval times. The choice is yours. Any questions? Any So the brother asks, what do I mean by Islamification of the UK? Islamification is a sociological term in which the narrative of Islam becomes the organizing principle of increasing spheres of our society. I'll give you some examples. When Muslims suppress freedom of speech in this country and the state goes along with suppressing freedom of speech to placate the Muslim community, that is an example of Islamification in our culture and in our legal tradition. Let me give you another example. Another example. When we introduce Sharia compliant finances to our financial systems. We have allowed for the Islamification of part of our economic systems. Now, I want to put it in context. There are many kinds of isation that we can talk about. Consumerization is a much bigger problem than Islamification. Liberalization is a much bigger problem than Islamification. We Christians need to get into the habit of Christianization. We need to rediscover the art of Christianizing the economics, the political, the cultural, and the um, legal. So, I hope that answers your question. Wait, wait, wait. Let someone ask, ask a question, then we come back. Okay, let, let someone else ask. Okay, make a remark, but I'm not going to go on. One example. Two weeks ago, here in the park, he asked for an example where Muslims have suppressed free speech. Ah, yeah, yeah. I will give you two examples. <laughs> One happened right here in the park two weeks ago. Yeah. A Christian sister yeah. wore a t-shirt that was offensive to Muslims. Yeah. A mob of Muslim men surrounded her yeah. and the police, rather than upholding her right to freedom of expression, suppressed her freedom of speech, arresting her. Ooh, Let me finish. Shameful behavior. But when, but when, but when the French Republic, but when the French Republic tells Muslims that they can't cover their face because it's offensive to the principles of the Republic, the Muslims accuse them of Islamophobia. So, ladies and gentlemen, the point is, the point is, let me deal with his point, because his point is based on a fallacy. The fact of the matter is, offence is a subjective thing. You take offence at something. You don't give offence, you take it. So the Muslims take offence at the t-shirt that Hatun wore or at the lessons taught by the teachers in North England and in France. But the French Republic takes offence at the idea of the face covering. So why is it when Muslims take offence, everyone should listen? But when the French take offence, his reply is, so what? That, ladies and gentlemen, so what, he said.
That, ladies and gentlemen, is the supremacist culture that I am warning you about. They believe that it is okay for them. The Islamists, not all Muslims, but the Islamists believe that they can offend you and you have to suck it up. But if you offend them, it should be considered a hate crime. Wake up to what is amongst us and stand up to these Islamist hypocrites and their double standards. When you were talking about the freedom of speech and you said you wore a t-shirt, yes. was that inciting violence? No. Or freedom of speech? Was yes. Talking? The question was, was the t-shirt inciting violence or was it her free speech? It was absolutely within her legal right in this country to be as offensive as she wants to be. One second. One second. Inciting violence is a very specific crime in British law. And causing offence is not the same as inciting violence. No, I'm giving you an education. The reality is, the reality is, the reality is, the reality is, the reality is that the Muslims insist that they have the right to offend the French Republic and French culture by wearing the niqab, even though millions of French people find this offensive, but they insist upon their right to be offensive. But if they are not going to be hypocrites, they have to accept the right of other people to offend them. No, if they are not willing to accept that they can also be offended, then they should shut up about what is happening in France and suck it up, Amen. just like they ask everyone else to about their offence. Yeah. Let him ask a question. Have you got a question? So what if she doesn't want to? What? So what if she wears an offensive T-shirt? Did you mob her? Did you mob her? I'm asking, was she mobbed? So what? Do you see? Do you see? Exactly. So all the progressives, are you listening? Are you listening, progressives? All you Me Too warriors. A small Christian woman was mobbed by Muslim men and his answer is, so what? So, my reply is, so what if the French Republic... Okay, let me go. So what if the French Republic outlaws the niqab? So what if the French Republic says that you can't wear a burqa? I say that we introduce a law in the United Kingdom that will make the burqa and the niqab illegal and if you're offended by that so what so what because we are not your dimmies and we need to counter in law this supremacist attitude of the islamists liberalism has made you weak but a muscular christian faith can make you strong again you need to abandon liberalism and embrace a muscular Christian faith. Yeah. Any other questions? He's got a question. So, ladies and gentlemen, and this is something else that we have to acknowledge, that the Islamists are much better at fighting this battle than the rest of us. Because, because the Liberals tell you that you should not care about politics 
and you should not care about religion. What are the three things you never talk about in a pub? Politics, religion and football. Now personally, I'm a rugby man, so I don't care about the football thing. But the reason why Western culture is dying is because the rest of us have not taken the battle for our culture and our society seriously enough. We have sat on our hands whilst our enemies have moved against us. And I want to be clear, I'm not talking about all Muslims. I am talking about that minority of Muslims who are the Islamists. I'm not talking about all liberals. I'm talking about that minority of liberal militant progressives. Marxists particularly. The reality is that societies are governed by the activist community. The problem with the church is that it doesn't have enough activists. It has enough devotees. We all go to church and pray, but we don't go and do battle in the culture. Engage in the culture wars. Engage in the culture wars like a crusader, like a Christian knight. Engage in politics like a warrior. That means that you accept like a soldier of Christ. It means that you unite no more denominational differences. It means that you train yourselves, educate yourselves about political science, about sociology, about economic science, how these things affect behavior. It means that you mobilize, you go out and you begin to change the politics, the laws, the economic structures, what is the artistic sensibilities, the culture, the traditions, what is acceptable in our society. And it means you resist. You resist the cultural Marxists. You resist the ethno-nationalists. You resist the Islamist. And you seek to establish a greater Christian civilization across Europe in networks of solidarity with one another. Any other questions? No, I've got a question. Um, so I believe that once Christianity's final thing comes and it's all is Eden and all is beautiful and you know rapture comes, uh, which is the ultimate Christian belief, that we're all going to live in harmony. And when we live in harmony, that's going to be pretty communist. We're all going to give freely. We're all going to love freely. We're all going to exchange freely. And there's not going to be, you know, you have to exchange money to get this thing. You have to blah, blah, blah. Once... What's the question, bro? Once Eden comes, it seems like it's going to be communist. So why go against communism? So the question is that since in the kingdom of God... In the kingdom of God, yes. That we're go it's going to be like a communist utopia, he thinks. Oh. I just that, wait, you've asked a question, let me answer. Yeah. Why resist communism? I'll tell you why. 20 million martyrs in the Soviet Union. That's why. Over 6,000 martyrs in the communists of Spain. That's why. Concentration camps in North Korea where Christians are dying. That's why. Where the Chinese persecute the church and tear down crosses. That's why communism is an enemy of the state. And this idea that the kingdom of God is going to be like some communist utopia, if that is your vision of heaven, one second, then, then I say to you that your vision of heaven is altogether too earthly, too worldly, and too human. The kingdom of God is going to be greater than anything we can construct on earth. That the rapture is an idea 
that is only a hundred years old. No Christian any time before a hundred years ago would have known anything about a rapture. It's an invention of an American church. Go on, bro. Sorry. Do, you, do you ever believe that we can live in peace and harmony? Do you, do you ever believe that? Obviously, within the Christian church and within the Muslim society. Could we ever live in peace and harmony? In a Muslim society? Yes. So the question was asked. Do you believe that in a Muslim society we can live in peace and harmony? Well, my answer to that is simple. My answer to that is simple. Go and speak to the Coptic Christians, who are the Christians of Egypt, and ask them if they've managed to live in peace and harmony, and they'll tell you no. Go and talk to the Christians who live in Pakistan, and ask them if they've managed to live in peace and harmony, and they'll tell you no. Go and speak to the Christians in Iraq and ask them if they manage to live in peace and harmony, and they'll tell you no. Go and speak to the Christians in North Sudan and South Sudan and ask them if they manage to live in peace and harmony, and they'll tell you no. Go and speak to the Christians of Armenia and ask them if they would live in, if they manage to live in peace and harmony, and they'll tell you no. Are you still listening? Go and speak to the Christians in Nigeria and ask them if they manage to live in peace and harmony and they'll tell you no because the fact is brother and it is a fact that your school teachers will not tell you because they will lie to you your teachers will lie to you and if you don't believe me go and check out the communities that I've mentioned let me finish go and let me check out go and check out go and check out the Christian communities that I mentioned to you because for 1400 years, wherever Islam has dominated, Christians have been persecuted. That is a fact. So, what about the other way around? Okay. So, let, let, let's address that point. Let's address that point. What about the other way around? Let me ask you this question, sister. Say I'm in a boat, and you're in a boat, and my boat's sinking, yeah. and your boat's sinking, yeah. and I said to you, hey, your boat's sinking. And you point to my boat and go, your boat's sinking. Okay. Does that help you? I don't get your point. My point is, it's called, you, what you're using is a logical fallacy. It's called, it's a logical fallacy. So I'll explain. A logical fallacy, if, if I, are you listening? If I'm a liar, and you're a liar, and I say you're a liar, and you say I'm a liar, the reality is that doesn't change. You're a liar. Now, now it's called what aboutism. So let me let me address your point. Today, we can count on one hand the number of actual Christian societies where Christians rule the politics. The Vatican, the Vatican, and and um, one second, one second. In the Vatican, there are Muslim refugees invited by the Pope. They have a prayer room. They're allowed to practice their religion. They're not persecuted. I'm telling you, in every society where Muslims dominate, Christians have been persecuted. Why? Yes. Yes. Have not Christians not done the same thing in the past as well as you know both sides? Yes, but Christians. Yes, I'm not denying that. I'm not denying that. But there's a difference. I'm not denying it. It's a fair point. But what I'm saying to you, it doesn't help Islam to say, well, you did it too. It doesn't make Islam valid because someone else also did evil. Right, but what does make it invalid? Because you cut to a point now. What makes it invalid is that I can point to you things in Islamic teaching that justify the persecution of my people. But I could give you a New Testament and you won't be able to point to anything that Christians did anywhere to justify the persecution of Muslims. In other words, when Christians persecuted Muslims, and we did, it went against our religion. But when Muslims persecuted Christians, and they did, and they still are, they're following the example of Muhammad. And that's why Islam is false and Christianity is true. Because which is a better moral system? The one that... See, I don't know enough information about each. 
Well, I'd encourage you to look into Christianity. Sorry. He was right. In Nigeria, do you know what they do in Nigeria? In Nigeria, they beat us. They go to us. What about the Spanish and the Americans? Sorry. Kill the, the Incas? What about the, what about the so-called founding fathers in America? We've already talked about it. If you were actually listening, we'd already address that. So what, sister? You, you, you just get that here. Don't worry, you're safe. No one's going to hurt you. So, so what I'm saying to you, yeah. Don't worry. There's enough guys that will jump in if anybody got silly. Trust me. So you're all right. What I'm saying to you is, you need to explore the Christian faith, right? Let me show you something in Islamic law. Okay. So Islam, Islam, Islam has a Islam, Islam. Has, do you want to stand this side of me, away from that sky? Are you sure? Okay. So in Islamic law, there's a rule that says that if you kill someone, you have to pay them blood money, right? That's, yeah. In Nigeria, let me um, just let me let so in 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 let let so. Did you hear that? In Nigeria, 32,000 Christians have been killed by Muslim jihadis. And Muslims, Muslims won't accept that. They won't confront it. They won't, they won't challenge it. There's a, she's a girl, bro. This is how we do in IPAC. Yeah. So, do you wanna do you wanna stand this side? Yeah. So, so, so the point the point that I'm trying to make to you in Islam, there's a law. It's called blood money. So if if someone kills someone else, they've got to pay them compensation. Okay. Right. Doesn't matter what the value is. What matters. Is if the say me and you are walking across a road. I don't know if you're a Muslim or not, but let's just pretend you're a Muslim and a Christian. Okay. We're walking across a road in an Islamic culture. We both get hit by a car. The blood money that gets paid to your family is le is 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 more than what would ha what would be paid for a Christian woman. And the reason why is because you're a Muslim and she's a Christian. Now, do you think it's fair to value the life of a Christian as half that of a Muslim? But that's what Islam teaches. So do you see why I have a problem with the idea of being ruled by Islam? Would you suggest this country, any religion ruling a country is good? Yeah, would you yes. say that? Really? Yes. Really? You wouldn't yeah. say that just diverse culture. You wouldn't say that Christians might turn to doing the, turn yeah. to doing the same thing like they had in the past. Yeah, so, so what, what I'm saying to you is, what I'm saying to you is, you can't remove religion from the equation. Yeah. No, 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 no. Well, in government. But you can't, what, I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, you can't even remove it from government. Because okay. a religion is a world view, yeah. right? So regardless of whether you're following a religious world view or a secular world view, yeah. you're still following an ideology. Okay. And that ideology will create winners and losers. Yeah. All of them do. Yeah. Christianity, if it dominated, has an understanding of the politic, which is this. That the point of politic, let, let's just take a couple of steps back, is distracted. Yeah? So, yeah. So Christianity has an understanding of politics, which is that the idea of politics is to diminish the opportunity of sin, it's to diminish the effects of sin, right? There's no intrinsic laws in Christianity that positively advocate for persecution. None. We don't have such an idea politically, right? But in Islam, it literally codifies rules that would make me a second class citizen and has done for 1400 years. Go and speak to the Armenians, go and speak to the Copts, go and speak to the Pakistanis, Christians, go and speak to them. Go, go and speak, go and speak to the Nigerians, go and speak to the Sudanese, go and speak to the Lebanese, go and speak to the Greeks, go and speak to the Serbians. They will all tell you the same story, that when Muslims rule their societies in the past or in the present, they are suffering. There are anti-Christian pogroms in Pakistan today. There are anti-Christian pogroms in Egypt today. How would you feel if a bunch of white nationalists went into a Muslim area, burnt down the mosque, burnt out Muslim businesses and attacked Muslims just because they were Muslim? That would not be very nice of them. Right. That is happening to Christians now. 
Oh. It's happening all through the Middle East right now. Yeah. Now the thing is, it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to take a step towards your friends? Yeah. Okay. So, so let's let's take a step over here because we're having a nice calm conversation. Yeah. So. So the point that the point that I'm, I'm I'm making to you is, in terms of the hijab, in terms of the the, the face covering, right? My criticism of that isn't the itself because Christians covering as well. I don't know if you know that, but we do, right? But when Muslims are suppressing other people's right to wear what 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 weeks ago, right? Right? Then they can't complain if another culture says, well, you can't wear the niqab or the head covering. Yeah, but you're not going to get there via Islam. No, no, no. I'm saying, as, as us as people, shouldn't, don't you think we should rise above that and say, look, you're doing us, but we're not going to do that to you. We're going to be better than that. Right. So, which religion teaches that is the question you need to ask. I don't know. So, this is, this is one of Jesus' commandments Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. So if that means that I don't want you to tell me what I can and can't wear, what do I do to you? I don't tell you what you can't, can and can't wear. So do you see how Christian principles get us to where you want to be? But in Islam, in Islam, yes, why? I'll tell you why. Because the Islamists in the park, the Islamists, not all Muslims, the Islamists in the park, are creating a double standard. To get them to recognize their double standard is to try to get them... Well, I'm not in a position to do it, am I? But what I'm saying is, but what I'm saying is, if you, if you make them feel offended that someone might take away their freedoms, maybe it will trigger something in their conscience that so they will not want to take it? away the, the freedoms of others. So rise above it as well. Or do you think it would just create a chain reaction, like a domino effect that would keep going back and forth, and then eventually, you know, who knows what will go away? Ideally, the best thing to do, the best thing to do is to allow people to have their freedom. Yeah, and I agree what they did was, you know, mob the right. you for yeah, a woman. That's mob. not right. Mob, and, and they mobbed Definitely. the woman. And I think, you know, police should have dealt with, I don't know what happened with that. Well, the police That's took the woman away, not the mob. Right. Yeah, see, so we've easy, we've got a problem in our society. I see that how that's a, an issue, but I yeah. don't think that should overall. I don't yeah. think that should overall, like you know, say that we should ban what they have as their you know cultural like hijab and stuff. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I think I understand your point. Like that wasn't right of them, but I don't think that should allow for hijab and things. Because well, we should ride above it, like you said, in in, in a in, in a Christian so. world, yes, in a Christian yeah, world. But the, here's the point. Here's the point. Right. Just <laughs> tactically <laughs> thinking. Right. <laughs> What we've got in our culture at this moment is a very weak liberalism okay. Okay. that refuses refuses to accept that there's any kinds of prejudice emanating from sections of the Muslim community. It won't accept it. Right? If you try to point it out, they call you Islamophobic. Right? If I point out that within the Muslim community there's prejudice against Jews, gays and Christians, people will deny it. They'll accuse me of some kind of prejudice. Even though I'm just pointing out a fact. I don't know if you know many Muslims. I don't know if you know Muslims that have those attitudes. But something tells me if you do know Muslims, you probably do know some Muslims that have those attitudes. That's fine. So the thing is, the thing is, the only way that we can suppress that kind of hatred and bigotry is to take away its power. When you've taken away its power, and it can no longer, because the thing is, it's pushing its ideas, and the liberals are retreating. Liberal-minded people like you are retreating, because you don't think there's any fight to be had. So you're running away from the fight before you even had it. I understand that it needs to be 
progressed within their own community. But I don't think when I know understand like we should if it comes if they're coming at us, I fair enough we should defend and stuff. But I don't think we should take away what they have. I understand diminishing their power, but that usually leads to people becoming desperate and then leading to other things, more extreme reactions yeah. within other like against the other community. That what I, and what I'm trying to get you to see is that the liberal paradigm of our culture, right? That I'm trying to get you to see that the liberal paradigm of our culture does not have the ideological framework or the narrative, the meta narrative, to see a problem or to address a problem. And this is where Christianity comes in. I understand why you just say that. That's fair enough. Yeah, I get that point. So what? What's your name, sister? Sweetheart, it's a lovely name. Thank you so much for having such a lovely conversation with me. Really appreciate it. Is this your first time in the corner? Yeah, it's my first time. What did you think? It's intense, right? Yeah, it is, yeah. but I'm enjoying it. So. Good, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. I, I, everyone that I talk to, I always give them a gift as a book. Yeah. So I'd like to give you a gift. Okay. That's all right. Have a read of it. Um, Thank you for having a civilized discussion. And why not? That's what Speaker's Corner is meant to be about. Not what happened two weeks ago with this mob mentality. Um, and my concern is that the police, the police lent into, lent into that mob because of their liberal ideology. Okay. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Okay, I understand that. And I'm suggesting that since liberalism is failing us, there's another way of looking at this problem. I understand also the police perspective of, uh, you know, media, how they would take that. Because media could have definitely influenced in the sense of being yeah. like, look, they're being xenophobic or whatever. But don't you see that as a problem? Yeah, see, that is, yeah I understand like, that. For instance, for instance, I challenge you right now, if you go on eBay or Amazon, you can buy t-shirts that are offensive to Christians, right? You can buy them, but why isn't it called Christophobia? Why is it if someone wears a, wears a, 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 a t-shirt that mocks the Christian faith? You've seen students how they dress up as nuns and priests and go and get drunk and, and mock our religion. Why is that not called Christophobia? I think it's just about minorities, really, and I think it's just been accepted. Exactly. And it's been accepted, bro, because people like you, whose heritage and culture is Christian, have been cut off from that culture. You have been lied to, and you need to rediscover it and own it for yourself and stand up for yourself. Because one of the things about the Christian faith is it, is it teaches us to stand up for justice. My ideal world would be allow a Muslim to wear a niqab if she wants to wear a niqab and allow someone to wear an insulting t-shirt if she wants to wear an insulting t-shirt. Yeah? But if I'm living in a culture in which one group has special privileges to cry out Islamophobia about what's happening in France with the face covering, I think you need to start researching the persecution of Christians in the Islamic world. I promise you, it will shock you and open your eyes. If I, if one last point, the only place that I can buy a black child as a slave today is in a Muslim country. I think that has to do with development of the country. No, right? no. The Islamic slave trade is still alive around the world. Okay, I personally can't comment on that, but... Look into it. Right. right, but the thing is, you're not taught any of this because your teachers have filled your mind with crap. Uh, trigonometry. No, trigonometry is good. <laughs> yeah, trigonometry. I studied physics, bro. So, you know, it's kind of like... Yeah, like he's doing uh, well, yeah but only at primary school. Like, so, so my point, my point to you is... You know all this. You know all this political correct nonsense that you hear, right? It's all a lie. They put filters over your eyes so you can't see what's happening. Go and research the persecution of Christians, because you've never heard about it. When was the last? Did, have you heard about it before today? Yeah. yeah. Have, have you heard about it? Yeah, the biggest denomination that like punished the rest of the Yeah. And do you know? And do you know? And here's the shocking. Here's the shocking truth. Right? In every single, every single is Muslim country. Every single one, without exception, Christians suffer from some form of discrimination or actual persecution. And you don't hear about it. That's even in moderate countries like Indonesia and Malaysia. 
and, and the, the Seychelles, you know, even in moderate countries it's happening. But you never talk about it, no one ever speaks about it. So you owe it to yourself to learn about your Christian heritage, to learn about the Christian faith, and to learn about what's happening to Christians. You owe it to yourself because you'll, at the very worst, all you'll be is more informed. That's the worst thing that's going to happen to you, is you'll be a bit smarter. All right, lovely to talk to you. God bless, take care. Bye bye. So what we've got guys is a double standard being taught by Muslims and particularly the Islamic militants of today. They are screaming blue murder about the fact that the French Republic has taken away rights to dress how you want. They're screaming about it, calling it Islamophobic because it's an offence to the Republican values of the French state to wear religious symbols in public. Now that's something, I, I don't even agree with that. I'm against the French Republic. But if they are saying, if they are saying, if they are saying that it's Islamophobic to do that, then why is it not a prejudice when they suppress Hatun Tasha's right to wear a t-shirt? Why is it not a prejudice when they suppress a teacher in France's right to teach or a teacher in the north of England to teach in the UK? Exactly. And why is the liberal state bending into these attitudes? Why? The thing is, if they can say you can't wear that because we find it offensive, yeah. then the French Republic can say you can't wear that because we find it offensive. Muslims need to reconcile themselves to the idea that if they want to be able to offend other people like they do in France with their niqabs and their burqas, then they have to accept that they themselves can be offended. But they won't because they feel superior though, Bob. But the thing is, because they sense the liberal establishment is weak, they push. And when they push, the, is, the liberal elites give ground and each time they give ground they encourage the Islamists to push some more so what's the solution? the solution is a muscular Christian faith that pushes back that takes ground and we can do that by rediscovering our identity <laughs>